Broadcasting from the Symphony Studios in Marietta, Georgia, it's time for the Technology Harmony Podcast, brought to you by Symphony Technology Solutions. Tune in every week as we spotlight the very best minds in our industry. Now, here are your hosts. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 36th episode of the Technology Harmony Podcast, brought to you by Symphony Technology Solutions. I am one of your hosts today, Katie Galley, and I am joined by my co-host, Matt Macheno. Well, Matt, with us today in the Symphony Studio, we are lucky enough to have Senior Project Executive at Gilbain Building Company, Henry Painter. How are you doing, Henry? I'm doing great, Katie. How about yourself? Doing awesome. Thank you so much for stopping by and uh, sharing your story with us today. No problem. We're really excited to get in. So, Henry, um, to kick us off, can you tell us a little bit about your professional journey and how you got the job that you have today? Well, I've been in the industry for 36 years. Um, What is different about myself is I am fourth generation construction. Um, I guess I was destined to be in construction. Sometimes when I have a very stressful day, though, I want to go see my father and smack him in the mouth for not being a doctor (laughs) or a lawyer, though. But, no, I love the business. Um, I started as a tradesman and then went to Southern Tech, which is now Kennesaw State, and studied construction administration. But I've also held many roles in um, my journey um, from field engineer to chief of party, cost and scheduling engineer, superintendent, project superintendent, project manager, project executive, and senior project executive. Wow. So a lot of, a lot of different roles you've held in your time. Well, I guess I wasn't good at one, so they kept moving me to the next <laughs> one. Just keep on going. <laughs> um, well, Henry, was there ever a time, I mean, fourth generation, that's, I mean, and just kind of finding yourself in this world of construction, was there ever a time you entertained doing anything else? Yes, uh, actually, when I started my journey into college, I was studying business administration. I was not going to go into construction. Hmm. Uh, you know, I was the kid that used to be building forts and, you know, building go karts, but I really didn't know what my father did. And um, it's an interesting story. I was working at uh, the county seat, a clothing store, similar to the Gap. And um, this is back in 1983. And I went home and said, hey, Dad, I got college paid for. He goes, how's that? I said, well, they're going to make me an assistant manager. Now, keep in mind, minimum wage is three thirty-five at the time. They're going to pay me $4.10 an hour, and they're going to pay for my college if I work 32 hours a week. And he goes, well, that's great, son, because I was going to see if you wanted to be a laborer. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to go into construction. He smiled, walked out of the room, and said, they do pay $14.83 an hour. I was like, $4, $14.83? Dad, come back here. <laughs> so once I got there, I did see what my father did. He was a uh, businessman in construction, and it lit my passion for construction. Mm, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, being seeing your father in it, being fourth generation, um, and really then developing that or having the opportunity to develop a passion for then the world of construction. And so, Henry, then coming into Gilbain, um, what do you do today or what does Gilbain actually do? What are their primary focuses and how does your role play into that? Well, Gilbane's a unique company. They were founded in 1870 and they're still family owned. And they do um, about $6 billion of revenue a year with 50 offices in 10 different countries. And, um, you know, what some of their landmark projects you may have seen, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., they did the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the World War II <laughs> Memorial. Um, so with Veterans Day being yesterday, we're very proud of those projects. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but... Um, you know, with the 50 different offices across the country, <clears throat> we do have a very diverse uh, portfolio from uh, corporate, multifamily, uh, federal food and beverage, uh, health care, historic renovations. We touch just about every industry. Hmm. And so as the senior project executive, how does your role specifically then play into all of that? 
Well, what my role is, is I will take a project from inception, early in sales, help put together the operations plan, help put together um, the guaranteed maximum price or the uh, bid itself, and then follow it through to completion through warranty. Um, you know, as a senior project manager, I'll be over multiple um, complex construction projects. And one of the interesting things that I enjoy the most about my pro uh, job is to also mentor and tutor the young project executives and project managers. Mm, yeah. And that's great. I mean, drawing on your own experience and how you entered into this industry, being able to give back in that way and, and mentor a young person coming up into um, maybe into a role similar to what you have. Yes. Um, you know, it's always, it's always fun when you watch um, the light bulb go off in an individual Mm -hmm. And they start understanding how everything's, you know, intertwined and connected. You know, one of the interesting things people don't realize about some of the major projects is how many businesses may be putting between 10 and $20 million of work in place in one month's time. Um, a lot of individuals don't understand that construction is more than just sticks and bricks. Mm, yeah. Henry, what, what advice would you give to somebody that's, you know, just coming out of a building construction program or perhaps engineering that's getting into this field? What, what one piece of advice would you offer? Well, that, that's a great question, Matt. I'll, I'll throw two things out there. One, never stop learning. Um, just because you've got a piece of paper and said you graduated, it doesn't mean you know how to build a building yet. Um, <clears throat> You know, you still have to study, you still have to research the plans, the specifications, new technology. But the other most important thing I would tell a young graduate is technology is always changing. Do not let the technology take over the process. The processes in construction have pretty much been the same for 2,000 years, but the tools have changed. Um, <clears throat> Katie may not be old enough to remember a light table, but Matt, I think you were probably coming in right at the end of the light table phase. When we would have to do overhead coordination, they would take drawings of conduits, ductwork, sprinkler lines, and literally put them on a table that lit up, and you had to find the clashes and find where you had to move um, the different members above ceiling, not to clash. That went to CAD, which was 2D, and now you're using BIM and modeling to do the same thing. You'll push a button, the computer will figure out where the clashes are, but it still takes an individual to determine who has to move and where the uh, ductwork or the conduit runs have to go. You still have to have a fundamental understanding of all the systems. You know, the technology can't ever change, you know, take that place. At least yes, of the processes. So, I, I mean, I've, I've known Henry in, in multiple capacities for about 20 years now and um, been on some of his projects as a contractor um, throughout my career. And I've seen some of the most complicated projects, I think, um, that you, you, you know, that you come across in, in the U.S. And most of the, most of the complex jobs that I've seen um, took place at the CDC. So I guess, Henry, the question for you is, you just, of all the lab buildings and, and, and construction projects you've done, what was the most difficult project you've, you've ever worked on? And, and after, my second question there is, um, what's the most difficult situation you had to overcome um, within that project? Well, I've got a thousand things going through my mind right now, so let me try to pick one. Um, well, probably one of the, the most challenging was the uh, CDC Building 23, which is a vivarium and a laboratory. And um, what, what made that an interesting project, it was a $280 million project, and as we were working during the pre-construction, um, the scope that they 
wanted was over their budget. And we had to take $28 million out of the project, 10%, to get it within their budget itself. Um, that $28 million was bigger than projects I started with when I was first coming into the uh, industry. Um, you know, probably, that was probably one of the toughest aspects. Um, you know, sometimes the sticks and bricks and building of a, a project is the easy part, and actually getting the project within the budget to meet the client's um, needs and to maximize scope is a very underrated aspect that a lot of people don't understand. That's a Did good that answer your question, Matt? Yeah, I remember that actually pretty well. So yeah, that's good. Um, the other thing is, um, just after you know, thirty someone thirty five years of being in the construction industry, I'm very passionate about construction. I, I'm really glad that I, I entered into this field, and it's you know, it kind of happens for me uh, different in a different way than Henry did. But what what makes you? I guess Henry, what makes you um, excited to get up? out of bed every day and go to work. I mean, what do you truly love about your job and, and what you do in construction? Well, it's never the same. Um, I'm not an individual that wants to come in, do the exact same thing every day. I do need a little variety and, you know, working in construction as a senior project executive, I get to deal with the sales side. I get to deal with the reconstruction side the operation side, and, you know, solve uh, complicated issues, figure out how to put schedules together that some people say um, can't be done, and it gives you a lot of satisfaction when you do that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the other part is leaving that legacy, and there's two different legacies. Um, I joke that when I see SunTrust Plaza downtown, but that's my daughter's building. That's the building she was, <clears throat> I was building when she was born. And I look at Buckhead Plaza and I call that my son's building. And, you know, being fourth generation, I am able to drive through different cities from Cleveland, Ohio to Chicago, Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Charleston. And I can point out to my grandchildren buildings that their grandfather, great grandfather, and great grandfather built. Um, but the other part of that legacy is trying to leave behind individuals that you have been able to shape, mold, and influence and know that you had some part to do with making them who they are, teaching them some of the tricks of the trades, and, you know, how to truly be a builder. Great answer. I love, I mean, I love thinking about it that way. I mean, Henry, I mean, you keep speaking about it. It's that construction seems constant and it's something that has always been there. I mean, fourth generation, right? And it's, but it surpasses the importance of just a physical building. Like you're saying, it's the impact, not just on people maybe living in it or utilizing that building, but it's your children, your children's children, and just living out that legacy in so many different ways. Yes, you know, um, the work I've done at the CDC especially with the pandemic out there, I know I did have some part to do with the research that they're doing out there. And, you know, it goes back to my, my grandfather actually worked at um, the Oak Ridge um, project in Tennessee when they were doing a nuclear bomb. So, you know, he was part of World War II history. And I guess my history is with the CDC. I've just watched Henry progress, you know, obviously I've, I've been in construction for, for 21 years, not obviously as long as Henry has, but I have seen Henry um, mold and shape a lot of young project engineers that have come in. And then I look and see where they've gone in their careers and they've become very successful senior project executives running, you know, very, very large projects in the Southeast. So no, I just, it's just interesting that, um, that Henry looks at that that way and just leaving not only a legacy of, with the actual building itself, but just the individuals that are going to go on and do great things on their own. So I, that was kind of impactful for me. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. 
It was. Well, Henry, um, really, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, if someone wanted to learn more about you, learn more about Gilbane, where might they do that? Well, I do have a very well-filled out LinkedIn page with all my contact information on there, including you know, my phone number and uh, email. That would probably be the easiest way. Um, go on LinkedIn and look up Henry Painter, D-A-I-N-T-E-R. Thank you all for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our guest and their company, check out the show notes for the relevant links. If you would like to learn more about us here at Symphony, of course, subscribe to our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook at Symphony Technology Solutions and on Instagram at Symphony Tech Solutions. Here at Symphony, our ultimate goal is to make harmonious music out of all the technological noise. And we hope today's episode helped in doing just that. See you next time.